Starting tomorrow, all Boston public school students will be back to remote learning as the city's coronavirus positivity rate climbs up to nearly 6%. And they won't return until that rate drops below 5% for two consecutive weeks. Of course, Boston is not alone as cases surge across the state and the nation, with nearly every state moving in the wrong direction and at least 12 setting new seven-day case records yesterday. Nationwide, we're seeing nearly 60,000 new COVID cases a day, the most since August. And former FDA commissioner and physician Dr. Scott Godlieb is warning things are about to get much worse. We're about a week away from starting to enter a period where we're going to see um, a rapid acceleration in cases. It's going to be a difficult fall and winter. And it's warnings like that which are helping to drive an unprecedented number of voters casting their ballots early in this year's presidential election. The good news is a few rulings this week have made it more likely people's voices will be heard. On Monday, the Supreme Court let stand a ruling that allows election officials to count mail-in ballots received up to three days after Election Day in Pennsylvania. Then yesterday, a federal appeals court refused to overturn a rule in North Carolina that allows absentee ballots postmarked by Election Day and received up to nine days later to be counted. And today, the New Hampshire Attorney General ruled that college students who registered to vote in New Hampshire do not automatically lose their voting eligibility if they're out of state due to remote learning or other reasons. So far, more than 39 million Americans have already cast their ballots between mail-in and early voting in person. But the bad news is that many are waiting hours in line in some areas, like parts of Florida, Georgia, and Wisconsin. There's a chance that your voice is not going to be counted. Why risk it? And where might that concern have come from? Mail ballots, they cheat, okay? People cheat. Mail ballots are fraudulent in many cases. And while even Trump's own FBI director has repeatedly said there's no evidence that that's the case, there is legitimate concern about how many mail-in votes will actually be counted. According to an NPR count, more than half a million mail-in and absentee ballots were rejected during the primaries, and that's just in the 30 states that report those numbers. And then there are the voter intimidation efforts, with Democratic voters in parts of Florida, Alaska, and Arizona reportedly getting emails this week reading in part, quote, you will vote for Trump on Election Day or we will come after you. Change your party affiliation to Republican to let us know you received our message and will comply. In all, nearly half of voters expect to have some sort of difficulty voting this year, according to Pew Research polling, with black voters in particular much less likely to say they think it will be very easy to cast their ballots. And it's not hard to understand why. After a series of problems during several state primaries in the spring, with drastic reductions in polling places, hours-long lines, especially in majority black and Latino areas, already at higher risk from the coronavirus. They've made it so difficult for people to vote here, just asking too much of people to come out with this virus going on. These are just some of the many issues journalist Jelani Cobb lays out in the new Frontline documentary, Whose Vote Counts, that could make a real difference in the outcome of the election. Jelani Cobb is also a New Yorker contributor and professor at Columbia Journalism School. Jelani, congratulations and good to see you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Good to see you as well. I fear that what happened in North Carolina, Pennsylvania, New Hampshire in the last 36 hours will convince too many people that there is nothing to worry about. If they see your film, you'll disabuse them of that. Uh, you looked at Wisconsin, the primary in particular. Why Wisconsin and what did you find? So we started this film before the pandemic hit. Uh, and we were looking at voter access and voter suppression. Uh, and the dynamics. And we were interested in telling the story that people don't uh, often hear. Uh, we've known the story of Alabama and Mississippi and the civil rights era and, and so on, but we're less familiar with the fact that voter suppression is now a national problem, that these things can be encountered in uh, states that were part of the union, that fought for the union, uh, in, in the North, in the Midwest, and so on. And uh, Wisconsin really had kind of a grab bag of all of these different issues with gerrymandering and the voter ID laws. And then in the midst of that, the pandemic arose and the battles over absentee balloting and the, the lawsuits that were flying back and forth, uh, they just all made it seem like we had made the right decision in telling the story there. 
Is it fair to say that there was a deliberate effort to disenfranchise certain voters by the Republican Party in Wisconsin, particularly voters of color? Yeah, I think that's a safe presumption because it, it was hard to explain. The arguments that we heard uh, just for holding the election during the pandemic just did not hold up. Uh, you know, we saw other places, they said, well, it's too late. You know, we're too close to the election. But other places that had elections scheduled right around the same time managed to postpone theirs. Uh, and you know, all the kind of concerns that people brought up, and they said there would be uh, cheating or fraud, and you know, the other states that postponed didn't seem to have that problem. Uh, and so it just seemed that, quite frankly, in the areas where there were going to be fewer polling places, there were going to be longer lines, people were going to have to risk contact with many, many more people, those areas would be uh, most likely to see a drop in the number of people who'd be willing to, to come out and do all that. And those areas happen to be overwhelmingly black and brown and democratic. You know, your uh, portrayal of current events was powerful, but I have to say the context as an historian that you put this in, that history repeats itself, made it particularly powerful. Here's former state senator uh, Henry Sanders talking about a case he was involved in in 1985. The U.S. attorney and others refer to these as the voter fraud cases. Uh, we, we decided that they were voter persecution cases. It was my impression that Jeff Sessions thought that those legal cases would stop black folks from not only using absentee voting, but it would stop black folks from uh, voting in the numbers that black people were voting. 35 years ago, Jeff Sessions, yes, the same Jeff Sessions, who was then the U.S. attorney for Alabama, the same state that, what, 20 years earlier, marches in Selma led to the Voting Rights Act signed later that year. So this has been a Republican strategy long before the pandemic, long before Donald Trump. Right. And there's one thing that the historical note that we have to bear in mind, you know, that the suppression that we saw in the South, we typically think of it as just an expression of racism, which it was, but it was a specific, it was driven by a specific dynamic, that these were the places that had the largest black populations. Mm -hmm. uh, if you looked at Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, South Carolina, all of them were over a quarter black. And that's a huge part of the electorate. Uh, and so we begin, we look at the rapidly diversifying uh, country, and what our census numbers look like, we begin to see the logic of why this ceased to be a regional problem and became a national one, why Wisconsin wound up doing things that would be more familiar if they would happened in Alabama. I should say, by the way, to finish the story, while I mentioned the Voting Rights Act in 65, I'm sure most viewers know that in 2013, in a case also out of Alabama, Supreme right. Court essentially gutted that. You know, uh, coincidence or not, it sticks with you. Donald Trump won Wisconsin by 23,000 votes. You were able to actually see the 23,000 votes that were not counted in the April primary. Mm -hmm in uh, Wisconsin, and by the way, 23,000 out of a much smaller sample, obviously right. not as many people were voting. What are some of the reasons why those votes were not counted, Jelani? So uh, one of the things that you see is that votes are not uh, rejected, absentee votes are rejected because of the signature match. People will say that the signature they have on file doesn't look like the signature uh, that they have on the ballot. Uh, sometimes people did not sign the ballot, you know, or have it properly placed an envelope within an envelope. Uh, or one of the big things that happened in Wisconsin was the photo ID law, People, which was very confusing. You had some people thinking that they had to send a selfie, uh, you know, of other people trying to upload their IDs. It was, it was a very complicated process. And what you wound up with was a mechanism or a series of mechanisms that made it likely that you'd be able to toss out ballots. And that happened disproportionately in black and brown communities. You know, I said to you yesterday when you were kind enough to join us on the radio with Marjorie Egan that I'm a numbers guy and 23,000 is huge. But in reality, it means nothing. It's just a number. And you went and met with a mother and daughter who are in charge of something mm -hmm. called Metcalf Park Community Bridges. Can you describe the scene when you don't just show them the number, 23,000, but you show them the names of people who were disenfranchised in the April primary. Right. I mean, that was really powerful because these are people that they knew. 
you know, and this is a, an organization that had been working to get voter turnout, to talk about the importance of your ballot and how your voice matters. And then they were then trying to figure out how to explain to people that in fact their voice had not mattered in that election. They had not been taken into account. Uh, and you know, one young man that they mentioned was like, oh, we talked to him and uh, we had tried to convince him to vote. And now how do we go back to him and tell him that it didn't count? Uh, and so that was a very affecting scene. And a very effective scene, I should say. So any reason to think November in Wisconsin will be different from April in Wisconsin? Uh, well, I think there's certainly the possibility of it. You know, we have been looking, the Columbia Journalism Investigations team uh, suspected that based on projections, there might be as many as a million absentee ballots that were discarded this year. Uh, and that could certainly, if we see another razor thin margin in, in you know, the Midwestern states, like we did uh, in the last election, that can have an impact on who wins. Uh, and so well, it is highly possible that we'll see those same sort of dynamics. And keeping in mind, it wasn't just Wisconsin with 23, Pennsylvania with, well, I think it was 10,000 yeah. votes, Trump yeah. margin 45,000 in, uh, in Pennsylvania, 10,000 in Michigan. So to end, to be clear, and I think that million vote potential is, answers the question, you didn't pick Wisconsin because it was aberrational. You picked it because, sadly, it may end up being representative. That's exactly it. That's exactly correct. Jelani, the film is really powerful, and I hope will make a difference. Thanks so much for your time, and thanks so much for your work. I appreciate it. Thank you. The film, again, is Whose Vote Counts. You can watch it now on the PBS video app or pbs.org slash frontline.